Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. And it's great to be back in Bournemouth. Uh, Bournemouth is, of course, the home of uh, the other well-known Hancock, Tony Hancock. Um, sadly, we're not related. Um, he is better at jokes. Uh, equally sadly, we can't make this Hancock's half hour uh, because you've only given me a 20-minute slot. Um, it's probably a blessing for you because um, that means that I can stick to the serious stuff. Uh, but it is, it's great to be here today, and it's fitting also that we're in Bournemouth to talk about the future and about how local and national government should work better together to make life better for people. Because the symbol of Bournemouth is, of course, its famous pier. And I think that the pier is proof that great things can happen when local and national government work in concert with each other. You see, in 1876, there was a fierce storm, and it destroyed the old wooden pier. And the people of Bournemouth demanded a new cast iron pier to replace the old wooden structure. But, and this bit might sound familiar to you, they were less keen about paying for it. So national government stepped in and secured a deal with a private company to build a new pier for £17,000 on the condition that the local commissioners of Bournemouth would agree. But Bournemouth's local commissioners did not agree. And instead, they came up with their own plans for a new pier at a cost of £20,000. And they managed to convince Parliament that their plan was better. Genius. And I'm sure that the local ratepayers were just as pleased that doing it in-house cost a little bit more, and the outcome was exactly the same. <laughs> and I tell this story because I want to let you know that I understand that funding matters. And of course it does. But what the people who benefit from the services that we provide really care about is the quality of the service they receive. And you know your local areas, you know your people, and you know them better, far better, than central government or services provided by central government like the NHS ever can. The relationships you build and nurture every day, these relationships ensure that people get the right support at the right time in the right place. And local services should be delivered in partnership with local authorities because that's how you ensure local needs are met, and that's also how we genuinely maintain democratic legitimacy. Even before the 1948 settlement, both local and national government have had a vital role in improving the health and lives of our citizens. And together, we need to make sure we should have a social care system that works effectively and works for everyone. It is one of the biggest challenges that we face as a society. Now, you know that we're committed to publishing a social care green paper. I thought I'd mention it because I thought it might come up. <laughs> and you know that the social care green paper has been held up by a combination of parliamentary logjam and a lack of cross-party consensus. And I want to level with you. Let me level with you. To tackle this great national challenge as a society, we need to be frank about the potential solutions. Of course, we need a sustainable, long-term solution to the funding of social care. The best solutions to these sorts of long-term problems are cross-party. And social care has been bedeviled by a failure to be able to build a cross-party consensus. Infamously, of course, during the 2017 election campaign. But more recently, too, I want to give you just one example. When my colleague Damien Green recently proposed a scheme that was very similar to a plan supported not by one, but by two cross-party common select committees, by 10.42 on the day of the launch, the Shadow Chancellor had condemned it as a tax on getting old. It's not the first time 
narrow partisan politics has got in the way of a long-term solution, but let us hope that it's the last. Because I think that the sense of the need for a solution is building and building and building. This isn't the only frustration. I imagine that you share my frustration too, that the debate in public focuses almost entirely on just one part of the system. Care for people as they get old is incredibly important. But around half of the cost of adult social care is for people of working age, and that cost is rising. And, of course, there's the cost of children's social care, which is increasing too. So, yes, we need a long-term solution, preferably cross-party, to put social care on a sustainable basis, but let us also be honest that direct taxpayer funding is always going to be an important part of the solution. Over the last four years, we've ensured an 11% growth in the funding available for adult social care, including the £650 million uplift we secured for this financial year. And securing a fair settlement for social care should be a key priority for the spending review. Social care has for many years not received the attention and the support that it deserves. And the only way we're going to solve social care as a problem that needs to be fixed is by building a new sustainable system for the long term that is, there, that is fair across the generations and also directly addressing the short term problems too. Now, I know that many of you are Greek because I've spoken to many of you about the problems that you face locally, and I've listened to your brilliant chairman, Lord Porter, and his brilliant successor, James Jameson. I just want to take a moment out to thank Gary for his public service. Again, this isn't the first time, but in this case, I hope it won't be the last. No one has championed the cause of local government more than Gary. We all owe him our gratitude. And I want to say personally, for my interactions and work with you, Gary, thank you. So as we work towards the spending review, I want to ask what can we do right now to address the challenges of social care? And I want to do this in collaboration with you. One of the things that I'm glad that I've done in the year I've been Secretary of State for Health and Social Care is institute regular meetings with the LGA, with James, uh, with Ian, who I recognize here this morning, to make sure that we have that regular dialogue in the same way that I have the regular dialogue with the leaders of the NHS. But let's go through and concentrate on some of the things we can do immediately whilst we wait for that spending review settlement that will inevitably take place under the new Prime Minister. First, we need to move ahead with the shift to integrated care systems, bringing together the NHS and local authorities, and crucially, giving both a seat at the table so that you can work together to make better decisions about local health services. That way, we can deliver improvements in the best interests of people rather than merely the best interests of organisations. I, I know that there's some great local examples of integration already happening, where we're bringing together health and social care professionals with commissioners and with providers, the NHS, local authorities. Places where I've seen it, in Hampshire, for instance, in Salford, uh, in Sussex, in West Sussex, indeed, uh, and, in, um, a, 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 and in Leeds, to name just a few. Uh, local areas are pooling budgets, jointly designated lead commissioners, creating more integrated systems so we can deliver more integrated and better services for local people. To make ICSs work and to have more place-based budgets not payments based on the click of a turnstile with all the perverse incentives that they bring. This is the direction of travel that we are going on. And of course, to make an ICS work, the relationships really matter, the relationships. And my message to the NHS and to local government is let's build those relationships to make place-based health a reality. Because at its core, it's about greater choice and greater personalization services tailored to people's unique needs. Now that is the vision of the NHS long-term plan 
And those commitments are in the making it real framework, and this is where we're headed. Second, health and well-being boards. Health and well-being boards, they are a vital component in bringing together local authorities, NHS commissioners, and elected representatives to create a strategic vision for a local area. So we're accurately identifying needs and coordinating care. Now, in places, in some places they're working brilliantly, in places like Coventry and Warwickshire, they've created forums to draw together all the constituent parts of health and well-being and care. True? True. In other places, they've gone even further and brought in police and the voluntary sector to share their expertise so we can tackle wider issues, for instance, like mental health. This is the kind of thing we need to see more of. And I ask you this question, because it isn't the case everywhere. How strong is yours? What can you do to strengthen it? We must support health and well-being boards to bring together leaders in one place so we can increase collaboration and so we can increase integration of services. Now, I also know that while health and well-being boards are the formal way we bring together NHS and local authority services, they are not always empowered enough. And I want to look for ways to see them more empowered. The third thing I want to mention is specialist training. We've listened to social care staff and what they keep telling us. And what they keep telling us is that specialist training to deal with the increasingly complex care needs they encounter is often too difficult to come across. So we're going to introduce a new specialist content into the care certificate. And we're going to help care workers get the skills and the training they need so they can help people with learning disabilities, with autism, or with mental health issues. Fourth, better leadership. Now, I don't need to tell a room full of local authority leaders about the importance of good leadership. It's leaders who create the culture, a culture in which everyone feels valued and feels part of the same team with the same mission. And that is so important across the areas that we are responsible for, especially where there's challenging circumstances. And I want to mention two parts to this. The first is the leadership to bring systems together. Now, since the 1948 settlement, the democratic legitimacy of the NHS has pointed towards national government through the person of the Secretary of State. And of course, the democratic legitimacy of social care has pointed towards local authorities and the locally elected council leaders. And we need leadership within that framework to be able to bring the two sides together. This is one of the reasons it's so difficult. You know that. I know that. And strong leadership, strong leadership that helps to integrate at a local level is vital. And our job is to enable that and to try to remove the barriers to it. That's the leadership that's needed at a national level. But then we also need stronger leadership within the system at every level. So, for instance, making sure that care itself is delivered as well as possible is critical. So we need to help care managers to learn how to lead too. We're going to make up to three million pounds available this year for care managers to access learning and development so that they can improve their skills. And we've also launched a recruitment campaign so we can attract the right number, the right type of people into social care. Ensuring that we have the workforce that can meet the growing demand for social care is essential, but it's also essential that we recognize the crucial role that leadership has to play in bringing families and bringing carers into the mix too. And that brings me to the fifth point I wanted to make. We're increasing the Carers Innovation Fund to five million pounds. This will help the millions of people who balance work with looking after a loved one. And we're also going to look into the dedicated employment rights for carers. Ensuring that people with caring responsibilities can balance their work and home lives is essential to creating an inclusive and a fair society. The sixth thing that I want to mention today is more control for care users. So this is tied to the whole direction of travel that we need the health and social care system to go in. 
We want to help more people to benefit from personalized care. And through a combination of the long-term plan of the NHS and the improvements we want to see in social care, we want to see 5 million people benefit from personalized care within the next decade. That means people having more choice about their own care, more control over personal health and social care budgets, and more connection to the community. Proper personalized care helps everyone to be treated like an individual. Everyone must be listened to and valued as an equal partner in their care, able to set their own goals and with the access to support so they have the knowledge and the skills to manage their own health and well-being. Now, over time, this is also part of a bigger and more radical change that I'd like to see. It's already started, but there's much more to do. And that is getting more people into the social care setting that's right for them, which means more support at home, more support in the community, and building the right sorts of homes and communities so that people can get the care that they need. This is a critical direction of travel that we must go on. And it's an agenda that doesn't cost more. In fact, it should save. But having more people supported in their own home and more communities built so that people can have the right care and often increasing levels of care in a community like some of the best care villages that we're increasingly seeing being built. It's about getting better services for people, but it's also better for budgets, and it's where a progressive society needs to go. The seventh, and I assure you the final area that I want to touch on is technology. Now, if you've been following some of the headlines, or at least the kind of ones, you'll know that since I've been Health Secretary, I've put a great emphasis on the drive for the use and uptake of better technology. It's where I came from before I came into politics, and it's what I've done in a whole series of ministerial jobs. And to tell you the truth, I was slightly worried when I became Health Secretary. I was worried that when I said that I wanted to drive the uptake of technology across the health and social care uh, sectors, that people would be skeptical. We've seen some attempts to drive technological uptake, in, especially in the NHS, and lots of people have lost their jobs over it. But the truth is that people have bitten my hand off, and the response of the system has been absolutely fantastic. And I think that's partly because we've got to be really clear about how we do this. So you might have seen some of the headlines that we've axed the facts and we've purged the pager from NHS hospitals and uh, generally made the technology inside the health and social care system. We've made the drive for technology inside the health and social care system to make it look a bit more like the tech that all of us use every day outside the health and social care system. But the reason that this matters isn't because we care about the latest gadgets and the gizmos. The reason that this matters is because it, the right technology saves time and saves lives. Now, to get this right, there are so many underpinning things we must do. The rollout of broadband and 4G and then 5G is a critical part of getting this right, and I'll always support it. And we brought in a new institution, NHSX, the specialist tech unit officially launched this week, which is going to take the tech transformation to health and social care. NHS X is there to drive the improvement in technology and data and the integration right across the NHS and the social care system, because you can't do one without the other. Now, we've already seen some everyday assistive technologies like Amazon's Alexa helping elderly and vulnerable people. Um, and, for instance, helping to remind people to take their medication. We've seen social prescribing apps that are being integrated with GP systems to give people greater access to social activities in their communities that can help improve mental and physical health. We've seen audio monitoring systems in care homes that help detect when somebody's had a fall or if somebody needs help. These are vital, life-saving pieces of technology, especially in that instance, at night, for instance, and they can reduce the burdens on the rest of the system. 
Now, NHS X is specifically designed to drive forward this mission, to spread the adoption of good technology that helps people to do what only people can do, which is the caring for each other. And we care for the technology because we care about people. And crucially, the culture, the culture of NHS X will be to support the brilliant work that's going on on the ground, not to impose it. NHS X will be a thin enabler, not a fat dictator. And in fact, this approach is my approach to NHS central management right across the country. The NHS at a national level should be a thin enabler, not a fat dictator. So these are the seven steps that I can outline today that we're taking to address some of the urgent challenges of social care. But it is not something that we can do in isolation. And the final point I want to make is this. Health isn't only what happens in hospitals, just like care isn't something that just happens in care homes. Keeping people out of hospital and in their own homes helps alleviate the pressures on the NHS, but getting people the care they need out of hospital and in their own homes is also the right thing to do because it's best for the citizens who we serve. Both the health service and the social care system are important in their own right, but in my view, they're part of something much bigger. It's about treating health as an asset treating people with dignity and not just treating diseases. It's the only way we can deliver on public health and the prevention agendas too. We rightly took the decision to keep the lead commissioning of public health services with local authorities because you know more about your local communities and you have the expertise we need to draw on for innovation, for delivery, to get better value for money. Now it's similar with prevention, the wider prevention agenda preventing people from becoming ill in the first place. This is the foundation of public health, and it's what local authorities have done brilliantly for decades. It's about so much more than the public health grant. It's about healthy communities. And the forthcoming prevention green paper and the prevention vision that's at the heart of the NHS long-term plan, these recognize the vital role that you have to play if we're to succeed in improving people's health because that is the goal. After all, good health is what makes everything else in life possible. To give the, a child the best start in life, to ensure everyone gets the chance to fulfill their potential. We need to change the way we think about health, to think of health as an asset. Now, this isn't just a change in policy, this is a change in philosophy. Traditionally, too many people take health for granted. When it's good, you tend not to think about it. When it's bad, we expect the NHS to patch it up and send us on our way. We're seen as a problem to fix, not an asset to invest in. But if we do invest in our health properly, and if we, each we as individuals, take responsibility too, then it's an asset that helps take us through life. Healthy children born into safe and loving homes, given the right guidance and support, will take that asset into adulthood and later life. Good health opens doors and opportunities. And like I said, health isn't just what happens in hospitals. It's about the right housing, the right environment, clean air and work that pays. It's about everything that you do in every part of a local authority responsibility. And it's so much more than what we can do in national government on our own. It's about local and national government working in partnership with each other working in partnership with employers and schools and the NHS and charities and communities and everybody else who has a stake. That is how we move from dealing with the consequences of poor health to promoting the conditions for good health. And it's how we help people live healthier, happier lives. And like the rebuilding of Bournemouth Pier, we can only do it together to build a Britain where everyone can thrive, whoever they are, wherever they live, and there is no one better to do that than you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Really good. Thank you. Um, right, conference. Uh, we need to be fairly speedy. We've got about four minutes uh, before the next session, and I, I'm sure we can't slip too much into that. So I think if we can take just two questions. Um, I'm sorry about that, but uh, really good to hear what you had to say. So can we, be, can we get the mics down, please? Ian, shall we go straight to you? And 
uh, and one at the back there. So one there and blue shirt at the back there. Thank you. Ian, Ian Hudspeth, uh, leader of Oxford County Council and chair of the Community and Wellbeing Board. Uh, obviously, you're aware of a few publications that have come out this week at the conference, and there's another one, one year on, which is celebrating and talking about what's happened since our green paper was launched last year. Here's your copy for you. Um, you also talk about the impasse as well, and we recognise that local government association, and we urge you to blo uh, break that down. We're happy to facilitate cross-party talks because we do it very well here, but most importantly, what are you going to say to the new Prime Minister to make sure he fixes long-term secure funding for the NHS, uh, for social care? Thank you. Thank you. I, I will take the second question, and then we can roll them together, if that's okay. Yeah. The uh, mic's at the back. Keith. Yeah. Um, hello. Yes. Um, Keith Glazier, leader of uh, East Sussex. I was going to ask you about the Green Paper, but you covered that very well. Uh, but I'm sure you well, do know... Well, not as well as I would have liked to, <laughs> Keith. I'm sure you do know the unmet need uh, uh, up and down the country and the contracts that are being returned yeah, yeah. and the stress that uh, our staff are put under day in, day out. Um, can I just pick you up on uh, the, the points you made earlier with regards to working in partnership? You know that we're absolutely dedicated to doing that. But how can organisations like us, with the uncertainty that certainty around funding that currently exists, go into that partnership with any certainty that we can deliver what we say? Because actually... Uh, we don't have the luxury of under overspends, uh, as you know. So the commitment for our health colleagues to deliver uh, services that we all want is really restricted when <clears throat> this year we don't know uh, whether better care funds and the improved better care fund will, will change. We don't know whether the one-off monies that uh, you made available last year will be around. And even if they were, uh, the percentage of increase with uh, wages and with demographics how on earth are you expecting us year on year to do that? And I do know you're talking about the comprehensive spending review, but we need it now. Yes. Thank, thank you, Keith. Well, uh, two excellent uh, questions. And um, in anticipation of the first one, I thought I'd better cover it directly in my remarks. Um, but I know that uh, both of the candidates for the uh, leadership of the Conservative Party are committed to this agenda. Um, I heard Jeremy Hunt uh, on the radio on my way down here um, and I've spoken to Boris about this and he regards social care as a key priority and um, the, uh, the commitment from Boris to make progress in this area um, is, a, is a clear one. So th that, is, that is vitally important. As I say though, we've got to be frank about the fact that while we need a long-term solution, we also need the short-term solution. And I appreciate that going from year-to-year -year funding is not the best way to run organisations. And we've done, we've successfully in the NHS won the argument for a long-term settlement uh, with a five-year settlement. And that, in a way, is my answer to your question, Keith, which is that we need this to be resolved in the spending review, but at a local level we need it resolved as well. Now, here I hope that the new ICSs will have a very significant role to play. There is, an, uh, um, there is a place for local authorities on the board of every ICS, and I hope that every local authority will take up that opportunity. Um, and crucially then, we can help to bring budgets together and plan budgets together across health and uh, local authorities across national and local responsibilities. The two areas where this has worked well it, within the Better Care Fund and also with the new approach nationally to commissioning sexual health services, which actually builds on the co-commissioning of sexual health services, which already takes place in some parts of the country, I think including in East Sussex. Yeah. Uh, and I saw it working well in East Sussex, and that was part of why uh, we've, um, we've resolved it that way nationally. Uh, so I want to thank you for the leadership you've shown in that area. Let's get moved to formal partnership working where we can co-commission services and where there are both consequentials for local and national uh, budgets. Let's work through that. Um, unless somebody is proposing to completely rip up the 1948 settlement, and I don't think anybody is, then we need to work together in a 
and have structures in place locally that allow this sort of integration, given that there ultimately are two separate democratic mandates. Um, and I think that we can get there. I think there's a lot of work to do. We need the spending review to be a critical part of that, but the work is ongoing. So whoever's the next prime minister, we can resolve this all with a focus on how we can better deliver for our citizens. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for being here today. I take from that the uh, real need for local politicians to get involved, take that leadership role, and challenge and support the local offer to your community. Um, and we have heard it here from the Secretary of State, and I thank you very much for being here today and saying that. Thank you. Thank you.